Welcome to the Stoa. The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere and dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. All right, check-ins. Um, yeah, I feel calm and stoic. I wish I had something, and I wish I had something more interesting to say. I think that's a, a longing for something more interesting to say with my check-in. All right, welcome to the Stoa. Uh, I'm Peter Lindbergh, the steward of the Stoa, and the Stoa is a place for us to go here and dialogue about what matters most at the nice edge of this moment. And uh, today we have Conrad Hamilton, uh, Conrad is a PhD student based at Paris 8 University, currently pursuing research on non-human agency in the work of Karl Marx. Uh, he's a contributor to the text, What is Postmodern Conservatism? And a co-author of Myth and Mayhem, a leftist critique of Jordan Peterson, as well as the author of a forthcoming book, The Dialectic of Escape, A Conceptual History of Video Games. Um, and today uh, he has a talk on... Um, I think it's Marx's Epicureanism and Peterson's Stoicism. And, uh, and the kind of the description is, is a question, provocative question. Is Jordan Peterson a crypto stoic? Is his rhetorical foil of choice, Marx, a crypto Epicurean? And then um, when I tweeted that out, someone said to me, or someone tweeted back, please don't spoil the stoic tradition by even remotely suggesting that Peterson's a stoic. So this event is already getting uh, the appropriate uh, controversial buzz, which is um, delicious. So how today is going to work is that Conrad is going to present for um, around 45 minutes. And then um, if you have any questions, throw them in the chat box. Uh, I will uh, unmute you. You can ask your question. If you, don't, if you want me to read your question on your behalf, because it's going to be on YouTube, just let me know and I'll read it on your behalf. Um, and then, you know, we might switch pivot uh, to uh, just kind of an open discussion. We'll see how it goes. Uh, but we have 90 minutes here in total. So uh, that being said, Conrad, I'm going to hand it to you. Uh, you're on mute right now. Yeah. Hi, uh, good to see you all. Um, so I want to clarify before I start, and I'm, I'm going to clarify this subsequently uh, within the presentation, um, that, uh, well, two things. First of all, I'm not by any means an expert uh, in Stoicism. Um, you know, modern European philosophy is my uh, area of specialty. Um, so, you know, there, if there are any errors uh, or inaccuracies in terms of my treatment uh, of Stoicism or, or Epicureanism, for that matter, I welcome uh, corrections. Uh, the second thing I just want to say is that I've kind of set this up as a bit of a thought experiment with which I intend to make a slightly different philosophical point um, about uh, the appeal to biology uh, in order to sustain philosophical structures, um, which we'll get into. Um, but, um, or notions of, of the fuses or nature, as it were. Um, but, um, but again, it's not actually, I, I don't mean to suggest Peterson is a Stoic, right? Um, that is not the function. Uh, you know, I want to, I want to play around with these kind of concepts, right? And experiment with them. Um, you know, and, and of course it's the nature of these sort of comparisons that you can say, well, someone's you know, X much like this or X much not like this, you know, there's certainly a level of variability uh, in how that functions. Um, so with all that said, uh, I want to, I built a slideshow. Uh, so I want to bring up the slideshow. Um, let's see this. Okay, so you can see my screen here. There we go. Everyone can see, yeah? Okay. So here we go. Uh, we have the uh, we have Marx's Epicureanism and Peterson's Stoicism. Um, with typical rigor, I just totally built this in kind of the default PowerPoint format. So uh, uh, don't expect any uh, uh, great sort of technical pyrotechnics. Should press like. So I just want to begin by discussing a little bit um, the very basically just the, the structure of Stoicism. Um, we see that Stoicism founded in the early or early third century uh, BC by Athen, uh, founded in early th early third century BC Athens by Zeno of Citium. 
Um, it's not a, a body of knowledge, but uh, a practice or exercise, skesis. Um, and in Stoic physics, uh, only corporal bodies, and I'll start a bit with the physics. In Stoic physics, only corporal bodies can act upon things or are existent in a way. Um, though in, in corporeal things like time, place, or sayables uh, are conceived of as subsistent. And for this reason, the cosmic life force of God uh, is conceived of in a certain way in biological terms uh, as a kind of logos or pneuma uh, that contains the sperm or seed of the world's development. Um, and in this structure, it's the rational agency of God that structures the, the passive inactivity of matter, right? So the, the, the pneuma or the logos, um, you know, is responsible for the arrangement uh, of matter in that way. This might sound like when you, when you talk about the, the, the role played uh, in structuring the universe or matter by the, the logos or the pneuma, this might make it sound like the Stoics are deterministic, um, but actually they had a, a more complex uh, causal structure. So they had notions of preliminary causes, sustaining causes, proximate causes. Um, you can't associate them with a the simple kind of antecedent causality. And we see that with Aristotle too, right? With formal causality, final causality, express, uh, formal causality, final causality, efficient causality, and so on. Um, you know, that it's not uh, based on a system of simple antecedent causality. Um, for the Stoics, the mind is a rational commanding faculty that can elect to assent or not to rational impressions. So here we get into the fun, uh, you know, kind of moral implications a little bit. A rational impression is something that can be exhibited in language. Um, and for something to be signified, there must be a signification, a signifier, and a name bearer. Um, so whereas uh, the whereas the 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 the, the signified is incorporeal, uh, a sayable can be adjudged as true or false. Um, well, these these this sort of refers to the the way that simple sayables or propositions work. Uh, the Stoics also had to develop a theory of non-simple propositions to fully defend these ideas. Um, so then you get the idea of like contingent propositions and things like that. Um, ideally, one should only assent to cognitive impressions, that is rational impressions, which are secure and unshakable, uh, but this generates uh, significant epistemological problems. So if you look at the, the debate between the, the Stoics and the skeptics, a lot of it turned around, well, what would it mean for, uh, you know, something to actually uh, be rationally demonstrable in language? So that we could call it a cognitive impression. So basically, you have the ability to assent or not to rational impressions, um, but how do you develop a criteria for determining what a rational impression is, right? And that's where you kind of get into this logical sort of substructure, right, and why it's important, right? Um, so very, very developed, right? You know, often there are, very, there are caricatures of Stoicism that are used, uh, but you see a very, very developed uh, kind of sensibility at work there. Um, now, in Stoic ethics, the only things that are truly good are human virtues, right? Wisdom, justice, courage, and so on. Um, but awareness of these has to progress through a process um, in which we start with basic needs, like food and shelter, and then we acquire moral virtues. Um, and these, these sort of lower level needs, like, um, you know, food and shelter, they're classified as indifference. Um, so while they might be good most of the time, uh, exceptions can nevertheless exist, right? Um, so, you know, I mean, for example, like, uh, you know, most of the time it's uh, desirable to have shelter, but if you, if imagine, okay, you're, you're Hitler, well, if you having shelter could be, is perpetuating some greater harm, then it's not good for you to have shelter, right? So, you know, there's just, there's sort of a generality that's used there, right? Um, and helping to structure our preferences is the rational character of nature. Very important. Um, so it's best is to live in accordance with nature, um, though exceptions will sometimes arise um, as when you would have to go without food to keep someone else alive. And this is, this is what I said about an exception, right, um, to uh, the good of the, the basic needs of survival. As with the Socratics, virtue or an expertise or techne concerned with life in general is assimilated to rationality. Um, so, um, like, there, the idea here is that, you know, there is no disassociation between rationality and virtue, right? You see this with the idea of, of assenting to um, verifiable 
uh, uh, cognitive impressions, right? Verifiable rational impressions um, that, uh, you know, to be rational is also to have, you know, an adequate moral framework, right? And in a way it's even more so, I was saying, than, than, with, the, um, than with the Socratics because you have no tripartite theory of the soul. So uh, there's a very, very rational dimension, right? To, to Stoicism in terms of functions. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk a little bit of Epicureanism. Sorry, I realize this is a lot. I hope, I hope it's not you know, too much for you, but um, Epicureanism is maybe a little easier. Um, well, Epic Epicureanism shares Epicurus name. It is like Stoicism, a longstanding tradition that started in ancient Greece uh, in the fourth century BC, and that was carried on to ancient Rome, um, where Lucretius was actually its most famous proponent. Um, and like Stoicism, it was also a popular or practical philosophy. So that's actually really important to note about both um, Epicureanism and Stoicism is that these were not um, purely sort of academic um, projects. These were actually, uh, you know, philosophies that people used to, to guide their lives. Um, so interesting in that way. Um, here we'll focus a bit on the ideas of, of Epicurus himself. Uh, so the physical theory of Epicurus builds on the early one of Democritus in positing that, positing that the world is comprised of material atoms that is solid, indivisible particulars below the threshold of visions that there's a space void between. Epicurus' method is largely deductive. He posits an infinity of atoms because without them, nature would regress to nothing. And the proof of their status as bodies lies on their contiguity with the visible structure of the world. So again, if you think about it, right, this is like your turtles all the way down kind of thing. Like if you think about it, there has to be a basic constituent of the material world, right? And that's how you logically deduce uh, the presence of atoms, right? So it's a kind of logical experiment that's performed um, from the standpoint of first-person observation. Um, while atoms function mechanistically for Epicurus, they are, unlike for, unlike for Democritus, capable of swerving in an indeterminate manner. So Democritus had a very sort of mechanistic conception of atoms, um, but Epicurus altered Democritus' conception of atoms by saying that um, they had a certain, there was a certain um, margin in which they could swerve, right? Um, you know, in terms of the voids they're moving in. Right? For Epicurus, the soul's comprised of atoms, um, which for him is proved by the fact uh, that only corporeal entities can, be, can move or be moved. Um, so in other words, like the, the, the changeability of the soul, right? And its capacity for sensation um, you know, proves the fact that the soul must actually be material or corporeal. Um, and, um, yeah. And by the way, we should remember when we, when you talk about the soul in ancient Greece, this is different than now, because now we tend, we tend to think almost definitionally of something incorporeal, which reflects the influence of the Christian tradition. Um, but like when Aristotle uses the term soul, for example, he means like it's anima, which is just principle of animation. So actually, when, when, the, when we often use the translation soul, I don't like the translation soul. I prefer anima um, because I think the problem when we use the word soul is we give it a spiritualist association, which it sometimes has in ancient Greece, um, but it's much more open-ended, right? Um, it's the princess, it's the, sorry, not the princess. It's simply the, the, the nucleus responsible for the animation of life, right? Um, so this, this theory of, of the materiality of the soul leads Epicurus to two conclusions. One is that uh, the atomic composition of the body is too delicate to be transmitted to the afterlife. And two, that the material soul is only responsive to physical impressions such as pain and pleasure, right? So we have on one hand, this idea that the afterlife can't exist because the, the soul comes from a particular composition of, mat of, of atoms, right? So how could, you, how could that get to the afterlife, right? Um, if, you know, um, uh, you know, it'd have to sort of be magically transported or something, right? Um, and he also, you know, there's a certain secularism here, uh, qualified secularism, um, in which he, uh, he points out that, um, you know, what defines the soul is what is palpable to us on a kind of sensual level, right? Um, so the sensations of pain and pleasure, right, being very, very tangible, are part, part of this material metabolism, right, in which the soul functions. In this context, ideas such as those of the gods come from thin films of atoms which are internalized by the soul, giving rise to mental impressions which aren't necessarily correspondent. 
so this is very interesting, right? Like part of the Epicurean idea here um, is that, uh, and, and you can actually see a strong parallel with, um, um, with, the, uh, with the work of David Hume in this respect. Um, but there's this idea that uh, the soul internalizes atoms that come from diverse sources, um, and then it manifests them as the notion of the gods, right? Um, but uh, again, that doesn't mean that the gods exist, right? Um, but actually, Epicurus didn't dismiss the existence of the gods. Uh, he just claimed that by the very nature of their perfection, um, they would have no need to inter intervene in human affairs, right? So classic, um, you know, kind of theological conundrum here, right? Uh, you know, uh, why would uh, God have any compulsion to intervene in the world if he's so perfect that, you know, whatever, it should already be okay, right? The soul uh, has, for, for the Ep Epicurus, as a rational and a non-rational component, and the former must be used to judge how to pursue the acquisition of pleasure or pain, right? So again, a very, um, you know, kind of sensualist uh, basis. Um, there are three kinds of desire for Epicurus, ones that are natural, uh, unnatural, but uh, unnatural, but desirable and empty. Natural refers to human necessities, like health and happiness. Unnatural refers to unnecessary amenities, like good food or drink. Um, and empty refers to extraneous conundrums, like fear and death, right? So you have three categories, right? Yeah, you have your, your stuff you, you, you need, right? Uh, you have your stuff that, that's nice, that facilitates pleasure, but isn't necessary. And then you have stuff that um, doesn't really matter, right? Like fear of death. Um, and maybe we'll get into this in a minute, but... Um, um, for the Epicureans, um, because they didn't believe in the afterlife, fear of death was totally, it's like, why would you worry about death when, you know, you're not going to know what happens when you die, right? So it's a dumb thing to worry about, right? So again, you can see the critique of, a certain critique of metaphysics, very interesting, right? A very, very early critique of metaphysics that's being posited by the Epicureans. Um, the swerve itself, the existence of it, permits the delegation of a kind of qualified human freedom, right? Because if, if atoms can swerve, that means that the atoms within our soul are not just following deterministic patterns, right? Um, that we actually have uh, a certain kind of freedom that's bestowed to us. Okay, wait. Okay. Now, in Epicurean, Epicurean, Epicurean social theory, Early egalitarian societies defined by scarcity were then replaced by autocrats who were then overthrown in favor of the rule of law. This is, I would say on an anthropological level, this holds up pretty well, by the way. Um, so again, um, prior to the creation of um, like agricultural surpluses, you had kind of relatively, comparatively speaking, harmonious subsistence societies. Then you have autocrats who uh, emerge because they appropriate um, surpluses. Uh, then in the context of ancient Greece, for example, you had the implementation of a kind of qualified democracy or Republican notions, right? Um, so an effort to allow forms of public del deliberation, right? So very interesting, right? It's a very, very sophisticated social theory, right? Um, with the rule of law, right? Uh, with the formation of, of, of um, you know, uh, these sort of more organized societies. Um, uh, with the rule of law came the development of systems of punishment that obstructed the acquisition of pleasure, right? This in turn colored the view of the gods, whereas early religious notions seem to emerge out of awe with nature, such as lightning, later ones are codified qua punishment. Um, so this is part of the critique of, of um, there's a critique of, of the formalism of legal society uh, in Epicurus' view, um, because if you think like, you know, if you think that the goal should be to facilitate pleasure, right, because of the material composition of the soul, um, you, uh, you know, you can see how a lot of laws might uh, obstruct that, right? Like to give you a very, very cursory example, like in our society, we have rules against the consumption of, of um, you know, certain forms of drugs, right? Um, now, not that Epicureans would have had a totally positive view of that because it can have deleterious physical consequences. Um, but, you know, I don't think uh, anyone suffers too much for smoking a bit of, a bit of J, right? Um, so you see the way that there can be a tension between law and, and pleasure in this way. And then there's this view that, which is very interesting as well, 
that um, like early religious ideas kind of express this, again, this, this sort of pure awe of natural phenomenon, um, but that the gods are, you know, religion becomes codified, codified in relation to punishment to support uh, the punitive character of the state eventually. Um, so the, again, quite a Marxist, very interesting, quite a Marxist dimension to that, right, in terms of um, base and superstructure. Uh, this idea that the gods have to become these moralistic figures or, or, or punitive figures uh, in order to, uh, you know, morally justify the actions of the state. For Epicurus, just laws are those that can be justified intercontractually as a means of promoting happiness, uh, whereas un unjust laws are those that obstruct it. So again, very interesting, a kind of primitive uh, social contract theory we see here, right? Um, still, he doesn't see breaking laws, though, as necessary, even if those laws are irrational. Um, because of one, the limited nature of our desires, and two, uh, its inconvenience, right? So go back, going back to, um, you know, natural uh, needs, right, as opposed to unnatural needs, um, he didn't think all the laws were good, but he thought, like, no matter what the laws are, you should be able to meet your basic needs, which is the important thing. Um, and also, the problem is, if you break laws, you'll potentially be punished, which can increase your pain and reduce your pleasure. And Epicurus placed a high value also on friendship or love, uh, philia, um, which he describes as a kind of utilitarian relation uh, in the way that, um, you know, you become friends with people because you seek the pleasure of uh, friendship, but then it's one for him that acquires a certain kind of value in of itself, right? Um, and there's, there's some ambiguity in that. Okay, so on to, on to, uh, on to modern society. Here we go. Um, wait. Okay. So Peterson and Stoicism. Uh, this is the, we get the fun part, right? There have been a spate of recent articles and blog posts which have sought to answer the question of to what degree the thought of Jordan Peterson reflects a Stoic impulse. Um, well, any comparison will invariably be approximate. Uh, we, we endeavor here to juxtapose his work with Stoic ideas. While the logos for the Stoics pervades and shapes the world, for Peterson it's largely psychologized. So remember you have the pneuma for the logos, which is coming and shaping inanimate matter for the Stoics. Um, for Peterson, Peterson, the logo is actually some, for Peterson, the logos, the logos is actually something psychological, right? Um, and the logos reflects from the search for truth, right? Um, and it, it, it's, it, it, it mediates between the two meta archetypes of order, which is associated with the left side of the brain and the masculine, and chaos, which is associated with the right side of the brain and the feminine. For Peterson, then, the logos is a largely subjective agency. And he credits Christianity, in particular, with announcing um, its subjective designation, right? Um, so, uh, you know, Jesus Christ uh, as announcing the capacity of humans um, to improve their circumstances uh, within the structure of their own world to form a cultic community, um, you know, kind of subjectivizes right, the notion of the logos in a way. Um, but what's interesting to note is that like the generative logos of the Stoics, for Peterson, the psychological logos is the privileged means through which extrinsic uh, material processes uh, are structured and interpreted. Um, so again, material, like the, the structure of the world for the Stoics, it comes from the logos as a generative uh, pneuma or, or logos that, that structures matter. For Peterson, um, like, you know, he says, I think at one point, like, um, what, what, what matters isn't matter, it's what matter, or what matter is he said, the, our world isn't based on matter, it's based on what matters. That's what he says, right? Um, so you see here for Peterson, um, materiality is always secondary, right? Um, he's, he's, you know, in a certain way, and we'll see, he's, he's anti-materialist, um, because for him, um, you know, you always have a subjective agent um, who has to interpret material structures and give them meaning, right? That's very important. Unlike Jungians like uh, James Hillman, Peterson tends to portray the struggle of subjectivity uh, or the logos as one through which chaos is tamed by the forces of order. Um, so Peterson's a bit unique in this, right? Like, um, I mean, there's a lot of debates and there was a recent one that was going on between our, um, Matt McManus and I um, and um, uh, uh, a guy involved in psychoanalytic practice and study whose name I forget, it took place on Marion West. Um, but he was saying that, 
there's a lot of unions who uh, dislike Peterson because they find that he stresses too much um, the role of order, right? Whereas for Jung, it's a more uh, complex relationship between the two. Not that Peterson doesn't have elements of complexity, but I think, um, what's the name of this? Uh, uh, tw it's 12 Rules for Life, um, uh, an antidote for chaos, right? So again, you know, even in that kind of presentation, um, chaos is treated like something that has to be combated, like the principal antagonist. I mean, a lot of unions do not see it that way. Right? This assignation of priority to order permits certain comparisons with Stoicism. Peterson, like the Stoics, believes that one must live in accord with nature in a certain sense, something seen by his first chapter of 12 Rules for Life, in which he naturalizes inequality by claiming, for instance, that the Pareto principle structures it. So in the, uh, in the first chapter, and we discussed this a lot, like at the last event, uh, in the first chapter for, of 12 Rules for Life, Stand Up Straight With Your Shoulders Back, um, Peterson uh, puts forth a model of nature, uh, he posits, uh, in which um, essentially uh, nature is inherently inequitous, right? Um, you know, so he, he talks about, um, you know, Price's law and the Pareto principle and how this applies to nature. He talks about the, the natural character of differential production, right? Um, and for Peterson, of course, if you transgress this, right, if you try to achieve uh, equal outcome, right, whatever that means, um, you, you know, the great risk is that you create totalitarianism. So we have to try to uh, address uh, certain forms of, of systemic inequality, but, but for Peterson, we have to do so um, in a way that uh, comprehends and represents the fact that individuals and moreover nature are differentially productive. Um, and, and here's a big, but, but here's a big difference, right, between Peterson and Stoicism. Again, for Peterson, uh, nature is not rational, right, fundamentally. Um, which means that the role of the Wogos is to order it without running afoul of its fundamental ontology. So again, the Wogos is subjective for Peterson. It's not situated um, at, the, uh, at the objective level. Um, so, uh, what, so in this way, you know, Peterson is, is less rationalist than, uh, than the Stoics because the Stoics perceive a fundamental harmony or order to the structure of nature. Whereas for Peterson, nature is cruel. You know, it's like, like Hobbes kind of nature. It's, it's, um, you know, sort of barbaric and brutal and unequal. Um, and, you know, in terms of, of rational order, um, what you have to have is you have to have a logos that can respect, uh, you know, that inequality and structure it without totally, um, you know, uh, trying to change it because that, that would be very risky. So again, should one insist on going too far in ordering reality, the invariable result will be totalitarianism. And I will add that while Peterson is not a logician, uh, this also leads him to an embrace of the need for logic, uh, which he accuses uh, the postmodernists of having abandoned, right? Um, and so you see the term phallogocentrism here, which is associated with Jacques Derrida, the French philosopher, uh, the idea that um, the idea that our, the logical structure of our sort of intellectual discourse um, is already characterized by the patriarchal or hegemonic position of, of, of the phallic signifier or the phallus, right? Um, so that, that's quite, that's actually quite complicated how that, how logic works within Peterson. But I think his, his position would be that we need to be logical because if we're not logical, um, we are not gonna be able to acknowledge or, or, uh, or represent the objective structure of nature, which is radically unequal, uh, and we're not going to be able to develop systems and means of uh, adapting to it. Right. Okay. So now we move on to Marx and Epicurus, right? Um, now, this is a little, actually easier, right, than, than Peterson and, and uh, Stoicism. Marx's doctoral thesis, uh, the difference between the dem Democritian and an Epicurean philosophy of nature investigated the ways in which the thought of Epicurus differed from that of Democritus. So again, we have a direct connection uh, in Marx's uh, intellectual history to Epicurean thought. In particular, Marx, remarkably considering the textual basis he worked off, stresses the importance of the swerve for Epicurus or the way that atoms do not follow pre-structured patterns. 
Um, so Marx, you know, actually traditionally people said, well, Epicurus, Democritus, same thing. Marx was one of the first people to really say, no, what Epicurus is doing is quite fundamentally different than what Democritus is doing because of the, the allowance of personal freedom. Um, or not just personal freedom, but I mean, the, the allowance of contingency in the universe, right? Um, and this is actually pretty amazing when you consider the sources he was working off because as we find more texts and, and understand better uh, the relationship of Democritus and, and Epicurus, a lot of what we've discovered conforms to what Marx sort of speculatively demonstrated already. Um, and this question, I think, for Marx was largely a question of how to do philosophy post-system, um, because Marx had to reckon with the work of Hegel. So, of course, when Marx was um, developing philosophically, the work of George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel was very, very dominant in a German context. Um, and such was the complexity and depth of Hegel's system um, that, in a way, uh, it, uh, the problem with it was it swallowed up everything else. Because for Hegel, you don't just have the truth. The truth is the negativity through, you which, through which you progress to the truth, right? Um, you know, uh, and, and it's changing. So he says, like, look at the time, right? It's 7.44, and one minute it's going to be 7.45. So how do you overcome a philosophy that has incorporated all philosophical dissidents or all intellectual dissidents into itself in advance? Um, and I think he's really struggling with this question, you know, um, when, he, when he talks about how uh, uh, Epicurus uh, uh, broke with Democritus. Um, so to try to break with Hegel, Marx latched onto the work of Feuerbach. Um, and Feuerbach argued that Hegel's dialectic is interpreted as having its true basis in biology. So that, for example, uh, the dialectic of religion uh, reflects the spiritual impulse um, pre-existent in all humans, right? So um, we codify, Feuerbach's idea was that um, we codify, for example, religious institutions. Um, we create all these moral rules, you know, this is what God says. But for, for Feuerbach, the truth of, of religion, um, you know, is the uh, need of human beings on a biological basis uh, for, uh, you know, solidarity, community, um, a certain form of spiritual participation. Right. Um, but of course, you know, this was quite fashionable in the left in Germany at that time, um, because if you accept Feuerbach's thesis, then you don't need formally organized religion anymore, because the truth of, of religion in a way becomes these very general moral ideas. Um, so by secularizing Hegel's idea and attempting to make the dialectic pivot on material particularity, Marx deduces an ascesis or practice through which capitalism must be overthrown in order to abolish alienation for man's nature to be realized. So let me unpack that a little bit. Um, so I talked before about how uh, Hegel's dialectic um, for Feuerbach reflects uh, uh, certain natural impulses that we have as humans, right? And, and moreover, social institutions like religion, which are part of this. Um, and Marx agrees with this. But what he observes is that religion isn't the main problem anymore. The problem is that our natural human needs are being obstructed by capitalism, right? Um, uh, so again, the sort of idea of alienation, right? Like you produce something, it's the object of your labor, you're intimately connected to the production process. Um, but under capitalism, you're producing things you don't want to produce for other people, right? Um, you know, which you know, engenders this, this, this frustration or diminution of the, of the subject. Um, but in a way, this, this attempt to read Hegel sort of biologically by Feuerbach, it fails. Um, and this is shown by Max Stirner, who in the 1840s, uh, he's, he, he basically says that, um, that all the, the socialists like Marx have really done is they've just naturalize the religious notion of man or the human. So Stirner's critique was that they're, they're basically continuing with religious ideas, um, but they're just putting a new label on them, right? So conscious of this, Marx alters his system in the mid 1840s, um, and he starts to try to think about, rather than thinking about um, humans as having pre-given bi biological needs and his dialectic reflecting that, um, Marx starts to think about, um, is it possible that even the idea of the human or the character of the human is conditioned by economic history. Um, so he, he, he shifts his system so that he starts with, um, you know, notions like value, 
uh, you know, relations of production, means of production, and so on, um, rather than starting with a biological and abstract notion of the human. Um, so uh, because of this dislocation between Marx's early humanist and biological work and his late sort of economic work, um, later Marxist thinkers tended to read Marx uh, broadly as either humanist or materialist. Um, so Michel Henry, a French um, Marxist thinker, he explains that uh, Marx's later work, he explains Marx's later works by appealing to his early humanist writings, whereas Louis Althusser, very materialist, very scientific, um, rejects these as immature um, because he claims they're still too ideological. And I wanna just add that, that Althusser in Materialism and the Encounter connects Marx's supposed rejection of the notion of man to a fuller realization of the materialist tradition that commences with the atomists. He calls this aleatory materialism. So for Althusser, to be, uh, Marx had to uh, get rid of the notion of this humanist or, or biological notion of the human being the basis of a system in order to fully realize uh, the materialism um, that uh, was already latent uh, in, for example, uh, the Democritian or Epicurean uh, traditions. Right. So here we go. So Peterson's problem. Here's, here we go. Peterson's problem. Um, Peterson's philosophy is in part popular because it offers advice directly to individuals as to how they should live their lives. And this it shares in common with Stoicism. To do this, Peterson appeals to certain normative structures uh, inherent in nature, right? And we see that with the, the Stoics as well. The notion of nature is pervaded by rationality, however, as embodying the logos, was far more tenable philosophically prior to the scientific developments associated with modernity. So again, when the Stoics were, uh, were writing, um, they, all, they could engage in, in um, broad speculation about how, how nature functioned. Um, you know, nature is structured rationally and so on and so on. Um, you know, modern science really poses uh, a, uh, a challenge, right, to, to, to that kind of generalization about nature. Um, so, of course, you know, to anyone who knows philosophy, we know, well, Immanuel Kant, right, uh, kind of signals the shift where you have, to, you can't just go out and, you know, make these kind of metaphysical suppositions. You have to ask the question of, you know, um, how those suppositions relate to the subject who's putting them forth, right? So again, Peterson, this is where Peterson, you know, he's a product of, of modern philosophy. Um, so uh, it, it's a far more subjective formulation of that. Um, Peterson attempts to overcome this problem. Um, you know, the, the, like the, the fact of having to, um, uh, the fact of, of the unattain unattainability of a full knowledge of nature by one, positioning consciousness as something that must represent without directly reprising uh, in egalitarian natural structures, and two, buttressing his autarkic image of nature with evolutionary biological researches. Um, so again, to try to, you know, Peterson on one hand stresses the distance between the subjective logos and the uh, structure of nature, uh, and two, he tries to defend his vision of nature by supporting it with things like you know, research and evolutionary psychology. But this is like a fairly fragile edifice actually, right? Um, so um, Peterson will say, you know, and this is very dubious, you know, in terms of the studies he uses, um, but Peterson will stay, say the fact women pursue STEM fields less in gender equal countries like Sweden um, proves that women are biologically, right? Uh, less interested in, in STEM disciplines, right? But this only really works if you accept like a very, very tenuous idea of these evolutionary archetypal structures. I mean, not many women did STEM 50 years ago and there's a lot now. Um, so you see the way Peterson has to, it, you know, it's, it's quite hard to defend sometimes how he uses that. Right? Um, and ultimately Peterson purchases his thoughts utility to individuals uh, by paying the cost of its philosophical coherency. So again, um, Peterson's able to, um, Peterson's able to, you know, issue this, this hard advice, um, that, uh, that is, is connected to nature, um, because, uh, he draws too far too direct a link, right, um, between, uh, nature, uh, and, uh, you know, structures of behavior, individual structures, right? Like I said about, 
you know, okay, well, women naturally are interested in STEM and this kind of thing. Um, so there's a real loss of philosophical coherency that, that happens in that way. So again, Peterson had, you know, he's able to use to, to not that he directly says copy nature, but he's able to use, uh, to, to claim that natural structures can offer us instruction um, only by, uh, you know, more directly connecting them um, than you really should um, to uh, the way we behave, right? Um, so here we go. Now we get into Marx's problem and solution. Uh, like Peterson, uh, Marx's early work justifies its appeal to individual praxis on the basis of biology, specifically Feuerbach's biologiz biologization of Hagel. So again, the early Marxist work, like Peterson's work, it used uh, uh, conceptions of biology, nature, to uh, justify the kind of anti-capitalist, in this case, praxis that one should engage in. But unlike Peterson, Marx relinquished this agenda because he recognized that it was intellectually untenable. Um, but we still see that in Capital, Marx's mature economic work, uh, that biology and subjectivity play a role. Uh, for Hegel, truth is temporal, but still exists. I think I said this. For Hegel, the truth could be, you know, at 744 and the next minute at 745, right? Um, and so rationality for Hegel is changing. Um, and it has to be brought into the world by different individuals or classes. Um, so, so, for example, uh, Hegel views Napoleon, the world spirit on horseback, as a, 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 a manifest um, uh, agent of rationalization, right? He talks about uh, state bureaucrats playing this role uh, in the philosophy of right. So it's not just philosophy in the abstract, right? Philosophy actually has to be, um, you know, manifested uh, uh, in reality. And borrowing this from, the, from this model, Marx posits the proletariat as the universal class in capital, um, whereas it succeeds the bourgeois in this respect. Um, so again, uh, for Marx, uh, there's nothing absolute or biological about the proletariat. It, it's brought forth historically, but the fact that it's brought forth historically, right, doesn't change the fact that it's the kind of appointed, historically appointed agent that's going to adjust history, right? Um, or ch radically change history, as the case may be. Um, so we see a, an effort to cultivate a notion of truth that doesn't require one to uh, assert its basis in nature, right? And Marx also alludes to the way that Hegel's dialectic agrees with Darwin, whereas nature is in flux yet permits successions. So in a way, Marx is also understanding nature differently because he's saying nature isn't just a fixed image, right? Um, it's always changing. Um, you know, of course, if, when Peterson says, oh, Price's Law or Pareto's Principle, that's true in nature. These are like massive you know, generalizations, right? Um, so again, for Marx, we see that, you know, in a way, just as nature changes and just as there are species that, um, you know, uh, succeed and overtake other species, um, you know, history is changing and there are social agencies which um, succeed and overtake other social agencies and change, change society, right? So you have the total kind of elimination of a really fixed image of nature, right? Um, and now I just want to talk, uh, Peter directed me to some of his work, so I just want to talk about a little bit about uh, some of the stuff Peter's written um, that I think has some importance for the SOA. Um, in, in their article, uh, Mimetic Tribes of Culture War 2.0, Peter Lindbergh and Connor Barnes propose a set of potential solutions for the multipolar battles fought by mimetic tribes. So for example, Trumpus, the dirtbag left, the intellectual dark, dark web, me Too, New Atheists, et cetera, uh, across our current cultural landscape. So again, it's talking about how all these different factors, um, you know, a decentralization of media, for example, political and economic destabilization and so forth, have led to a situation where um, you have this multipolar warfare being fought um, by these online groups, right? Um, somewhat different, you know, decidedly different than our, our traditional uh, you know, um, political uh, uh, processes. Um, so, to, you know, because they see, you know, because uh, Lindbergh and uh, Barnes see, you know, all the sort of chaos and the incapacity to, to facilitate discussion, this creates, um, you know, all these different cultists, right? Um, they propose certain, um, you know, means through which we can adopt collective structures to remedy this, right? Um, you know, the diffuse, uh, good faith oaths, right? The diffusing of the agonistic structure of debate, rendering philosophy more accessible, and, and so on. 
Um, well, these are all fine proposals. I think the risk here is that subjectivity becomes kind of over unified um, so as to justify the notion that current struggles could be rectified uh, through the collective subscription uh, to a set of liberal and consensual norms. Um, Lindbergh and Barnes acknowledge that the current crisis has a socioeconomic basis with the rep. Okay, well, what I want to, what I should say about this is what I mean is that you can talk about these sort of norms of interaction, um, but like, you know, in a way, um, and this is thinking about the, the analogy with Darwin, right? The way certain social agencies overtake each other and so on. Um, you know, the problem is it's, I think it's very hard to get people whose uh, opinions are so radically different about how the world functions, right? To participate on the basis of the same set of norms, right? Um, so I think, these are, I think these are very, very good proposals. Um, but again, when I say over unified, I mean, I think in a way all this kind of presupposes um, that there is some kind of common basis, right? And I was talking about, much of this lecture was about the risk of kind of fixing, right? A notion of, of the subject, um, that there's a kind of totally common basis upon which people can relate to. And I'm not sure if that's the case. Um, Lindbergh and Barnes acknowledge that the current crisis has a socioeconomic basis um, with the reference to Leotard's thesis of how technological changes undermine grand narratives, for example. So um, uh, Jean-Francois Lyotard, uh, was a, a French philosopher. He's responsible for uh, the term postmodern because he wrote a book that was commissioned by the Quebec government called The Postmodern Condition. And in that, he talks about how the difficulty of um, the huge amount of information that's becoming available to us based on um, digital and automated processes has created a difficulty in aggregation that's eliminating our view that there are these sort of tidy, large scale narratives that can be used to structure history. Right? So we're constantly exposed to different narratives, different versions of history, um, and we have a very, very difficult time unifying those. And this for him is, is characteristic of what, what postmodernism is, right? It's an, also an economically and technically induced change. Um, but I think, you know, if, if, if much of the problem is socioeconomic, I think we have to say also that, you know, addressing this disunity will require a socioeconomic solution, right? That you can propose certain strategies that may help, but that to really fix this problem, um, there has to be uh, uh, a unification of our socioeconomic reality, right, that addresses this difficulty of aggregation. Um, for Machiavelli, every republic is founded in violence and seeks to build consent retroactively. Uh, he uses the example of the Roman Republic, right? Um, so uh, Romulus kills Remus, right? That's the foundation of the Roman Republic. Um, and the Roman Republic, but the Roman Republic later becomes, uh, uh, you know, uh, democratized. Um, that's complicated too, but just, just roll with me. Um, so you can see this all the time, right? It's like, you know, in America, what was the first founding gesture of America? It was like, do you support our democracy? Okay, if not, get the fuck out, right? Um, so, you know, the French Republic, uh, China, um, you know, like it's very, very hard to start a republic under democratic conditions. Usually you have to commit a considerable acts of violence to achieve unification, then you have right, your kind of consensual democratic participative conditions. Um, the notion of the universal class, like the proletariat that Marx puts forth is not about plural consensualism per se, but about the identification of a social actor that's capable of both ideologically and materially creating the conditions of freedom or universality or of sublating contradiction. So what I mean here is that the question, the more important question may not be how do we relate to each other um, on a good faith basis, um, it may be, what is the perspective? If we look at these different tribes that exist or are emerging, is, does one of them have a perspective um, that could actually achieve the unification of the polis, right? In other words, that could, through you know, the committing of acts of structural violence, um, could they bring about the conditions through which our society could become unified uh, and through which um, these kind of good faith uh, processes could uh, again prevail? Um, so, uh, there you go. And that is, uh, if I'm not mistaken, yeah, that's the end of my, uh, lecture. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Conrad. And it was, uh, um, a pleasure seeing, uh, my name and Connor on a PowerPoint slide. <laughs> I, I feel like, uh, I stepped up my intellectual game there. Um, so if you have any uh, questions for Conrad or anything you, you just heard, 
um, just right in the chat box. Uh, and, you know, we'll start off with actually Jacob, because Jacob said uh, he didn't have um, a question per se, but the critique. And that's okay too, if someone kind of just uh, provides a critique on what they heard, and then we can have a little back and forth, Conrad. Sure, yeah. Cool. So, uh, Jacob, uh, you're up. So, uh, thank, thank you, Conrad, for, for all that. It's a lot there. Um, so I just preface this, this, it could be that you didn't mean to write it this way and that this is, and it's not actually what you meant to say. Mm. And so this critique is hinging upon something you wrote and I yeah. realize you might not even mean this. And so it's open to, like, it's not concrete, right? Cause I realized you could have just said something badly or something. So I'm kind of going for your neck here. Okay. Take it, take it. Uh, I mean, the possibility it's, it's, that I would make 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 a mistake in the presentation of, of these subjects, which I'm not so familiar with, is very much, you know, built in. So I invite this. Right, right. So I I find it hard to take any of your arguments seriously. Let's say, if there's a general current of a misapprehension of of Peterson's teaching, since I I saw like several of like, man, I think you're profoundly misapprehending it. So here's just one. And this is the one that maybe okay. you just said badly. As you said that Georgian Peterson doesn't war warns against too much ordering. And so it's actually the opposite of that. Because you want infinite ordering. Because you're open to the chaos enough to where you're constantly engaged in the process of integrating information. So you're actually constantly ordering. What he's against is too much order, which is the opposite, which is where you build a wall and stop the process and just okay. concern yourself with what you've already mapped. And so Anyway, that's just an example of where you've got something perfectly backwards wrong. And then it's like, well, how can I trust anything you say? And so there's, there's, that's, there's not, that's not, okay, just to say about that, that's not, that's not like, you know, of course, like, you know, you can find these, these particular phrases, but I don't think that's so out of sync with what I was actually saying, right? Because I was saying that he acknowledges, you know, so you refer to a distinction between order and ordering, right? Um, and I mean, the way you're describing ordering, it's the achievement of a kind of mediation of chaos by order. Right, if I understand you properly, right? Sure. Well, yeah. not. I wouldn't say actually no. Not in my mediation of chaos by order. A mediation uh, of chaos by the by the logos. But but nevertheless, go ahead. Okay. Okay. Well, the logos is, is very involved in this mediation, right? That's that's yes. you know, us yes. sort of. Um, but but again, I don't think that that you know I I I very clearly acknowledge here you know in terms of the logos uh, that. You know, and it's characteristic of, of psychoanalysis in general, and particularly union psychoanalysis, um, that uh, however what mo however one much tilts in the direction of order and chaos in terms of um, their inter interpretation of Jung or psychoanalysis more generally, that there's going to be an acknowledgement of uh, the sort of co-determinative nature of these processes, right? So we can talk about order and ordering or whatever, right? Um, but again, um, this basic notion right, of, of the acknowledgement of a certain level of chaos, um, you know, I do recognize that. And I think that's, that's very primary uh, to what I'm trying to put forth, right? So I, I don't, I, like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to sit here and dispute, you know, the content of, of you know, a, a few lines that appeared in Peterson's work or something like that. Um, I'm not a Peterson scholar. I don't think many people are Peterson scholars, uh, though I've probably, you know, spent more time reading his books than the vast majority of his fans even. Um, but I will say that I think the basic matrix that I'm positing, um, you know, is not suddenly rendered, you know, totally invalid on the basis of this sort of critique. If it is, I, I would appreciate if you'd explain that. Um, well, only in, only in that it's such a, it's such, it's so core. It's like to understand the nature of what he means when he says too much order. It's like, it's, it's a, it's blood component of his teaching. And so if you get that wrong, it's like, anything underneath it's going to be wrong. Okay, and so you have to, and you have to you explain to me, you have to explain to me how that functions, right? Because ordering, you said that he says stop ordering. That's not what he says. And so you're saying something he actually didn't say. Okay, but you have so, to explain to me, you have to explain to me the importance of that to the systemic structure that's being put forth. Well, because like, if, if it's happening at a surface level, which, and I, what I mean by surface level is like, like that's a package, right? 
too much order, that's a package. And, and then what underlies that is tons of information. But if you're expressing, if you're expressing that top layer wrong, it's like, okay, but you're just, you're repeating the same to, thing, right? You even have to go deeper. We but you're repeating this. Well, you're saying, why do you have to go deeper? I mean, I'm asking you to go deeper, right? You may not have to go deeper. You may not feel you have to go deeper, but I'm oh, asking so like you to deeper do that. on why that's wrong. Okay. Because too much ordering is to say that it's bad to be ordering too much. And it's actually what he's saying is it's good to be doing it constantly. So that, that expression, too much ordering is an, is a non, it's, the expression is misleading. Okay. But the process of ordering involves the, the mediation of chaos, right? Sure. But I don't see how that's relevant. I'm, it's, it's not relevant. Well, but it would, it would be relevant, right? Because what it would mean is that, um, you know, you can, you can refer to it in terminologically different ways, right? You can say, uh, you know, the mediation of order and chaos or the super proliferation uh, of order as ordering, you know, in this mediation. Um, but again, we're not talking about some, like, if we're talking about something really fundamentally different, I would just ask you to illustrate very concretely why. Because, you know, order this, is something, this is something a lot of Peterson fans do, right? Um, you know, is that they take, you know, some kind of semiotic slippage or something like that, you know, and they, and they declare someone that they can't. Order is a thing. noun. Ordering is a verb. It's like, that's the chasm we're dealing with, man. Okay, I'm just going <laughs> to yeah, like, jump in. Time out, time out. Uh, I, I just want to like, Conrad, because um, we have other people in the room, okay, I just yeah, want to yeah, be sure, sensitive sure. to the question. Thanks, but like, um, you, you can, if you want to maybe have a little bit more of exchange here, but uh, I just want to just check in the pulse. For sure. Yeah. Is that cool? Okay, mm -hmm. yeah. cool. Um, Billy, you had a question. Um, yeah, I, in, in the uh, the presentation you're given, I, I was kind of interested in the role of uh, the idea of being in accordance with nature, and uh, just wondering about how the idea of 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 nature was for the Greeks versus today with our with our evolutionary psychology kind of perspective on things, uh, because. Mm -hmm. um, to me, a big a big question is whether we should be acting mainly in service of our own pleasure uh, while we're here, or if if we feel like mimetically, uh, if we try, if if we make any attempt to go against nature, we will inevitably be pushed back because it's kind of like swimming upstream, and and that it will be futile to do anything that goes against uh, these kind of like mem the mimetic try, try to create memes that don't um, f flow in accordance with uh, what evolutionary biology says w we must behave according to the laws of which I, I, I see like things like what Peterson says about mm -hmm about his um, relation to nature as being kind of about just the futility of trying to uh, do things that like in a game theory perspective, your, your, the memes that tell you to go against nature will die out. Um, so, so what did the Greeks think of nature? And, and uh, I guess Marx as well. Mm. Mm. Um, well, so there's a lot in that question. Um, so I'm just going to maybe focus on the sort of more succinct or concise way you put it forth uh, at the end, just for starters. Um, you know, one thing that is elided a little bit by this presentation is how different in certain ways the, the modern conception uh, of, of nature is compared to the ancient Greek one, right? Um, so, um, you know, the, um, in ancient Greece, you have the fusus right, which is different than the conception of, of, of uh, nature in the modern sense, right, sort of something created uh, by a cosmic watchmaker god or whatever, you know, that, that can be sort of be mechanically manipulated in this way. Um, so the fusus is actually uh, constantly in a process of uh, a certain kind of uh, transformation, right. Um, but I think, again, um, what, uh, what, even though you had this idea of, of the fusus, you still see something very common um, within 
uh, ancient Greek philosophy, which is sort of the metaphysical generalization of nature. So even if it's a more kind of amorphous uh, portrayal, you still have that, that strong tendency. Um, and I think uh, the importance of someone like Darwin in this respect is that he furnishes scientific justification for the transform transformability of nature that doesn't function purely on the level of a kind of metaphysical supposition, right? Um, if that makes sense. Um, uh, you know, of course, even Darwin um, is precipitated by efforts to think, um, you know, the transformability of nature uh, against, um, you know, the more uh, absolute schemas that were common to sort of the empiricist ideologies emanating from the, the, uh, uh, the English world. Um, so, of course, you can talk about people like Schelling or Goethe, for example, in German Romanticism. Um, you know, Schelling associated with nature philosophy. Uh, Goethe also associated with nature philosophy. So, you know, again, um, prior to uh, uh, Darwin, right, uh, we have an effort, a, a more speculative effort, even within that European context, uh, to think against, um, you know, this more uh, mechanical and absolute conception of nature. Does that, does that help at all? Um, I guess, I guess, uh, I, I don't completely understand the, um, the fusis concept because it's it's very different from what I have been kind of raised with an understanding of uh but um it is if 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 we're trying to practice like stoicism today mm -hmm. um it it seems like there's a lot of knowledge about about what nature is that has transformed um, some of some of these ideas and and, and brought mm -hmm. to light some understanding of of the nature and and like to to me to me it 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 is I've kind of been vacillating between this idea of it's futile to um to try to do any project that uh is not aligned with what appears to be the kind of attractive attractor points of the dynamics of evolution um which means it's kind of futile to go against like hierarchies and stuff and Pareto principle because we observe that that is kind of an attractor that seems to exist um and and just it seemed like Epicurus, there was something about um, you should be in accordance with nature, but not if certain other things happen. And and that the Stoicism also had something like that. Yeah, yeah, there are, there are exceptions um, that are placed into it, um, for sure. Um, I mean, I think to try to get at what you're saying about um, the notion of, um, I mean, you talked about hierarchy and the inevitability of that to our modern day uh, conception of nature. And I think we have to understand kind of the historical specificity of that idea too, right? So when, when Darwin um, is, um, is writing, you know, one of the things that Karl Marx observes about Darwin is that uh, in a certain way, his work is greatly influenced by Malthus, right? Now Malthus, minister, uh, classical political economist, um, you know, sort of posited that we have to, uh, uh, you know, it's preferable to starve out the poor uh, because of uh, the tendency of populations to proliferate um, exponentially, uh, whereas food supplies uh, grow linearly, which like, if that were ever true, it would have been true in a pre-industrial context, right? Um, but the point is, there's actually a tension in Darwin, um, in The Origin of Species, between to what degree he's saying like the strongest win and to what degree he's describing a more uh, plastic and aleatory process, right? Um, and so it's his cousin, um, uh, you know, Francis Galton, who really gets into this with like survival of the fittest um, and uh, that proliferates into social Darwinism in the 20th century. But again, uh, the part of the reason I'm not so uncomfortable associating Marx a bit with Darwin is because I know that's not the only way you can read Darwin, right? Um, so there's something deeply retro in a way when Peterson um, looks to nature and all he sees in it. And it's no surprise here that, that um, uh, wait, sorry, I just went offside. But there's something very, very uh, retro when Peterson looks to nature and all he sees are these very, very, you know, tidy principles of hierarchy, 
so tidy that they can form with these pre-given mathematical structures, apparently, right? Um, like if you look at uh, Stephen Jay Gould, like if you look at the research he's done on evolution, um, his big uh, sort of uh, hot take uh, is that uh, there's like a high level of contingency that's involved, right, in the evolutionary process. Um, you know, and that's quite credible scientifically. Um, so uh, I, think, I, I think generally the real challenge of thinking Stoicism today is how do you, how do you connect the Greek notion of fusis? Is there a way of connecting the Greek notion of fusis to um, the more contingent and variable portrayal of nature and evolution um, that uh, we see um, having overtaken to a large extent today uh, these more, you know, hierarchical, simplistically hierarchical conceptions. Now, the simplistically hierarchical conceptions still have a lot of currency within popular culture, but again, within science, I don't think that's the dominant element, right? Um, does that does that help? C could I take a stab at my interpretation of Billy's question? Sure, sure. Um, so <clears throat> what came to mind in what Billy is asking was kind of this example. Um, I visited a monastery in Nepal and I tried to meditate with uh, the monks there. And I thought it was really interesting. Like on the first day, people were coming in at 5 a.m. And one guy would always try to come in a little bit earlier the next day and so on. And by the time I'd left three weeks later, like it was like kind of every, like the first guy was coming in at 442. Um, and I was kind of like, kind of intrigued by that, that like that starting point was going forward. And basically I'd asked them like, what the hell are you doing? They were competing to be the first one there. Um, and what they were spending their time doing was, you know, obviously um, different aspects of Buddhism uh, often around. Um, yeah, it was just, it was, it was hilarious to see people learning about um, kind of the limits and foolishness of ambition and all of that. And yet like, instinctively like without him them even noticing like competing to try to be the next abbot by being you know the first one there and the abbot having him praise um there's another meditation teacher named john yates um behind a popular book called mind illuminated and in spite of how enlightened he did he got um he recently kind of lost his position because he was just caught like sleeping with tons and tons of prostitutes um <laughs> <laughs> and so i guess maybe that's what it is it's like you can try to do all these things but you can't like that you still have that animal part of you. And so in spite of your best intentions, that mm -hmm. natural side or whatever is still going to come out. I guess as Billy, would that, would that be a better, would that be an understanding? Well, okay. So, so here's, here's something for you. Like, you know, again, um, and my supervisor, Catherine Malibu is working a bit on this question now. Um, you know, if you look at, um, uh, what's the name of the book? If you look at the, the famous anarchist, uh, Peter Kropotkin, he wrote uh, a sort of, uh, very famous, uh, the title eludes me now, but it's a uh, response to, um, you know, the co-opting of Darwinism to justify, uh, you know, uh, inequitous social hierarchies. Um, and what he discusses in the book is the absolute essentiality of the development of forms of social cooperation, both to evolution, um, as well as to the formation of different societies. So I guess, you know, when you talk about the animal part, right, I think it's already very, very risky to associate, um, you know, necessarily... Don't literally on those words yeah. okay um but but this is what i'm saying right like here's here's what's interesting right because you're talking about um you know these sort of values you know whatever i think or anyone else thinks about these values you're talking about how one should overcome ambition and this kind of thing well you know and i'm not not attributing it too directly to you but just saying if we're talking about these higher order moral concerns um i think um the real question would be is it possible that that those are actually imminent to the structure of nature um, so that there's a way of updating the stoic conception of nature um, so that, uh, you know, it's not just, oh, you have like a base selfishness, then you have this external, uh, you know, set of, set of higher injunctions, right? Um, can, we, can we develop a conception of nature that, that, you know, supports a refinement of this way of thinking um, in its totality? Right? I, I guess another way then to respond to that would be like, uh, Harari has this great thing where he's like, the most important thing in my life is meditation. And if everybody meditated the way I did, like the role would be saved, but meditation is not scalable. And so like kind of to Billy's point, like, like there's a minority of us who have enough metacognitive power, or enough, enough ability to take short-term pain for long-term gain and apply knowledge over these evolutionary impulses. But to Billy's point, I guess it's like, that's not scalable because it comes into contrast with these evolutionary, uh, 
patterns. And so that would be the question I guess I'm asking is, is this inherently an unscalable approach? Well, maybe, maybe, maybe it's not scalable. Maybe it is. I mean, you know, because I think that um, one thing, you know, going back to the way that Marx used biology in his early work, um, you know, I think one thing we see is that, um, you know, the, um, you know, I think, I think, I think belief often functions, you know, in its religious form as a crux for people who are going through very, very negative circumstances. Um, but I also think that, um, you know, get like a, a less dogmatic um, form of concern um, with uh, these sort of more elevated moral questions, so to speak, um, is more common amongst people who already enjoy a certain level of social comfort, right? And we already see this, you know, in North America, like corporate Buddhism, okay, you know, like, uh, uh, and so on, uh, Madonna's um, Kabbalah and so on. Um, and, you know, without saying like, well, that's all good, right? What I want to say is that I think in a way, if you're trying to expose people to, um, you know, having the time to reflect and kind of develop themselves, I think one way of approaching it is, you know, what, you know, can, are we bestowing people with the, uh, you know, material conditions they need to do that? And are we creating um, an intellectual culture in which those kind of opportunities are, in addition, uh, available to, to all people? Um, so I think the question of scalability has to be addressed very broadly in that way. But I think the, the point from Billy, if, if I interpret correctly, and the way I would do it is like, it's exactly that. Even if you were to get the norms right, and even if you were to do all the things you're saying right, it's to, the point here is, what if it still is only 10% of people? Well, yeah, well, I mean, what... The, the way I mean it is more like if you, I, I analogize it to the idea of not being in accordance with nature is kind of like trying to swim upstream. I mean, it's it's possible. It's just you'll get it. You'll be there's a chance that you'll be making all this effort and just nature and and uh, this this kind of inherent uh, entropic principle of of nature will be working almost exactly equal maybe not exactly equal maybe you'll make some progress but it, it seems to me like like there's lots of traditions that to various extents what whether it's about changes in society or changes in yourself like like in in zen practices and mm -hmm. as well as the stoicism and stuff they, yeah. they all talk about uh, a need to be in accordance with nature versus some some traditions uh the idea is to is that our nature is sinful and that our, what we need to do is to try to escape from from our nature in a way versus living in harmony with it um and i'm just and and it's just that Jordan Peterson uh, seems because he's very interested in evolutionary biology. It seems like that, like this being in accordance with nature, is kind of part of the reason why he makes a big deal out of oh, this is what we observe in nature, and therefore you should live in harmony and acceptance of this being the way that things are uh, not necessarily that it's impossible to go against them, but uh, that you will live a more harmonious life if you, if you take it as a given that things will go in a certain direction. Before you respond, Conrad, uh, I want to sneak in one more question. So if, if you can respond, then I'll, I'll jump in. Sure. Uh, do, you, do you want to respond to Billy? Oh, or? sorry. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll respond. And then, then, you, then you're going to ask a question. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, I just wanted to say very quickly, you know, I think these are all interesting questions. I think um, in a way, you know, and it's no mystery that Jung, um, you know, there was a, uh, he had a much more positive view of religion than Freud did, for example. For Freud, it was a kind of collective neurosis that's outlasted its significance. Um, you know, I mean, ultimately, it's, it's the terribleness of the world, which, you know, is supposedly scientifically gaugeable um, that causes Peterson um, to, uh, you know, positively evaluate uh, the need for these kind of um, somewhat escapist spiritual notions. Um, not not totally, right, because of the 
the mediation of order and chaos or ordering or whatever, I don't know. Um, but, um, uh, you know, but I, I think what it really speaks to, again, I consider Peterson's concept of nature quite limited and reductive. Um, and I think what it really speaks to is that um, if you're going to, um, if you're going to base your philosophy on a conception of nature, which we see in a way is true of all of Marx's work, more directly in the early work, but even in the later work, I said we see this parallel between the fluidity of dialectic and the fluidity of evolution, um, that you have to make pretty sure you have a good conception of nature, right? Um, and I think that, you know, for Stoicism, especially um, for this kind of discourse, I think that's a really good um, uh, place to start is, is uh, you know, what, con what conception of nature are we using? Cool. So um, I just want to just be cognizant of the time. Uh, we have to close up exactly 10 minutes. I got another another call after this. Um, so the question that I had is uh, referring back to the, the slide on the, the white paper, the culture war white paper. Um, so first I'll say like, I have like, I'm not attached to any of the propositions on that paper. It was more sort of, uh, I viewed it as a psychoactive drug that could help people see like the current culture war landscape differently instead of like a, a bipolar war or as a multipolar war. Mm, yeah. And then the speculative proposals, um, they were just speculative, number one, and they weren't a panacea, um, but they were also selfishly um, motivated or there's a selfish bias there. Because yeah. uh, when I wrote that paper and I still today, there's like, you know, being, um, not having a political home, having that feeling and, and being in this state of unknowingness and just being like having a thirst for real dialogue so I can figure out what the heck is going on. Um, and then especially then, and, and now too, the environment when you think in public, or this is what the felt sense that I had, is that um, it was a dangerous game to play. And not just from kind of like the social justice activists, but from all kinds of mimetic tribes, reactionary or whatever. Um, it felt like you're being mimetically gaslighted and attacked for thinking something that does not correspond to what they believe to be true. Um, and then ours our, this kind of sense making space. We talk about uh, there's this meta crisis where there's a sort mm -hmm. of like uh, ecology of existential risks and suffering risks and, you know, social economic uh, issues is definitely one of them. Um, so I'm totally on board that we need to have um, what you said, a socioeconomic solution. Uh, but I'm curious how, what do you think the role of good dialogue is in regards to that? which those spe speculative proposals, a lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of them gesture towards. Do you mean, do you mean, how do you mean, like, do you mean good dialogue, like as regards socioeconomic issues or, or just, can you frame that a little for me? Yeah, yeah. So, so like, let's say, um, good dialogue that will help resolve the medical crisis, including social economic issues. Okay. Um, I mean, I think, um, for me, I think, uh, <clears throat> a big problem is that, um, <clears throat> you know, there's a real hesitancy, I, I think, in our, um, in our world. Uh, and, and I don't necessarily approach it narrowly and, and um, you know, so naturalistically, but this is one thing I do, you know, kind of like about Peterson's cynicism, um, is I think uh, there's a real um, hesitancy, uh, you know, by anyone, especially who has achieved uh, any level of uh, privilege, and I don't mean that in like the SJW sense, just, you know, in general, um, to acknowledge the important role that forms of social de determination play um, in where we are, right? So if you look in the United States, your likelihood of going to university is exactly the same as the wealth level of your parents, right? Um, and, you know, again, if you get a discourse like philosophy, right, I think a big part of the problem is that most of the people who have the ability to study philosophy are already people who come from these, um, you know, more affluent backgrounds. Um, you know, if you tell someone who comes from a more socially mobile kind of bourgeois background, if you say, well, look, you're very socially determined, I find they almost always have a very negative reaction to it. Um, if you tell working class people that the reaction is usually less negative because they've lived that and known that in many cases um, for every day of their lives in some way or another. Um, so again, I think the first step toward um, you know, I see a lot of these problems in terms of um, this anger uh, as being driven by a kind of um, abstract moral presentation of how people develop these views, right? And I think when you consider how much we're structured by our communities, how much we're structured by our families, how much we're structured by our level of wealth, um, we've talked about race, gender, so many things, 
um, I think that um, in a way it becomes easier in a certain way to facilitate dialogue because you're not just blaming people, right? Um, you know, for the disposition that they have, right? Of course, I do think people who have access to more education have more responsibility um, to probe, right? Because of that, that privilege that they're bestowed with. But I think it's very, very important when you engage with anyone um, to try to appreciate um, how their positions, and, and including our own, by the way, right? I don't mean to say like one's going to be a philosopher God and help her above everyone. On the contrary, um, it's very, very important to consider the way those are structured by social factors. Um, but again, that also requires, because, you know, philosophy as a sort of bourgeois discourse has this uh, obsession with kind of um, freedom and social flight. I think it requires a kind of remedial intervention into philosophy, um, you know, to try to uh, accept social determination as a way of addressing it and reducing it, right? Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, let me just double check the time. So my understanding is that um, you need a really good kind of a social economic analysis on people's sort of positions. Uh, so you get a feel of like the, the, I guess the privilege hierarchy. And so then you can like address it accordingly and appropriately to the, the context. Yeah, Which yeah, and, yeah. And I think like, I think, um, you know, uh, I think this, this, you know, I, I think this is like very, very common to how our ideological structure works where you don't really understand the, like, and we're not encouraged necessarily to understand the imperatives that drive different groups, right? So again, like, you know, you look at now like this whole um, kind of, you know, talk about breaking down of dialogue. If you look at the whole anti-China thing that's emerging, right? It's like, you know, and invariably we always look at China and we say like, and I'm not saying everything they do is right or anything like that. But it's very easy to look at it and say, well, they're not, you know, liberal democratic like us or whatever. Um, but it's like, wait, how did our republics emerge? Was that peaceful? You know, because I'm pretty sure it wasn't when we were that disunified, right? So when you actually situate something like the Chinese political project in a certain kind of um, socioeconomic structure, you know, it's not like saying, well, this is just good, right? But it gives you a basis to actually have an honest dialogue. Um, you know, and I think the same, you know, if you're approaching anyone like someone from an older generation, um, men and women across social classes, I think it really, really helps to have that framework, right? Right, so you can adjust appropriately. Uh, one thing, um, a term that I like, uh, it was like civility porn. Um, and I think another would be like dialogue porn, <laughs> you know, it's like by uh, sort of um, proselytizing dialogue in a certain way that's tone deaf from, you know, certain kind of different analysis, then I think that could be dangerous or not productive. Um, so let's wrap it up there. Uh, okay. Conrad, do you have any um, like closing thoughts for us? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, I think, um, uh, I think, you know, I, I just want to stress that, um, you know, it makes sense if someone is trying to defend, um, you know, a somewhat um, you know, kind of strictly sort of rigid uh, uh, conceptions of social hierarchy uh, that they would appeal to uh, those kinds of ideas uh, in nature. Um, and, you know, again, I think, I think nature is, is, is but I, I do think nature is much more variable uh, than we give it credit for. Uh, there's a lot of potential for flux, contingency, uh, uh, radical change, uh, and so forth. And I, I just want to, you know, I want to point out, you know, if we talk about Peterson, um, very often um, he uses the word uh, merit, right? Um, you know, we need societies based on merit. Well, where, this is very interesting, right? Where does the term merit come from, right? Um, and, uh, you know, if you look at uh, the term merit, Basically, it, it comes from this idea, and this is laid out explicitly uh, in uh, an address uh, made by the uh, founder of Sciences Po when he launched the university. Uh, he says, you know, we're no longer us rich people, us aristocrats, we're no longer going to be able uh, to dominate society just based on our vested privilege. So we have to begin to acquire merit, right? Uh, you know, in order to justify our ongoing domination. Now the term meritocracy actually comes from uh, a parody right, a satirical work uh, of this sort of ideology, uh, this kind of uh, bourgeois rationalization of social domination on the basis of merit rather than vested privilege. Um, so again, I think, you know, uh, there's a, there is a, I, I think it can be very compelling um, to try to, um, uh, 
you know, uh, I, and worthwhile, right, to try to uh, look at the structure of nature as a way of posing the question of how we ought to behave. I do not dismiss that. But I think we have to be very, very careful about the way that a lot of people, uh, you know, when they look at nature, uh, what they see uh, is a rationalization uh, of the dominant social order, or paradoxically, just a rationalization for, um, you know, a kind of uh, intellectually uh, pallid uh, leftist politics. And that's the risk. I mean, Marx says in his early work, he says, you know, the problem with the German forests is when you shout into them, they don't shout back, right? Um, so, you know, I think we need to pursue the question of nature, but we have to be very, very sensitive uh, about how it can be manipulated when we pursue it. Cool. Awesome. So I'll make some uh, announcements uh, for upcoming events. But uh, Conrad, thanks so much for coming to the STOA and taking on the Stoics on their, on their own territory. I, I love it. Um, I'm an unusual. We have 12 people here, by the way, now, because, you know, everything is good that happens in small numbers. Like Olympics, total bullshit. Jesus Christ and his disciples, 12. Okay, this is, this is important, right? Yeah, we, got, we, we arrived. We arrived, my friend. Um, so uh, upcoming events. Um, tonight at uh, 10 p.m. Eastern time, uh, the, our first uh, raw sexuality series with Maybe Gray. She's doing this new sense-making series at the STOA, and she kind of talks to all these people in sex work or who talk about sexuality. And this one's uh, called No Filter with Kaveh, the filmmaker, New York filmmaker Kaveh Zahedi. Um, Kaveh is a friend of the Stowe. He's been on before. He's like a really super meta filmmaker. He was a, this is a film called I'm a Sex Addict that kind of like chronicled his journey into sex work and then out of it. Uh, so that's going to be a really juicy discussion. Uh, definitely check that out. And tomorrow, James Kars, author of Finite and Infinite Games, is going to be at the Stowe. He's going to do a session called Playing the Infinite Game During a Meta Crisis. Uh, that's at 3 p.m. Eastern time. So that's going to be dope. Check that out. Um, I guess I'll, I'll plug this one too. The dangerous space. Um, so we talk about instead of like a safe space, we talk about dangerous ideas that will get people canceled if it's recorded. That's uh, June 20th at uh, 12 p.m. Eastern time. You can RSVP to that. All right. Uh, and the store is based off a of gift economy uh, where it's, uh, I just revamped the gift economy website. It's, I love it. Um, so if you, if you want to give me, the STOA, or any of the facilitators a gift directly, feel free to do it. And we view the STOA as a gift for us to use in this time of need. That being said, thank you so much for coming out today. Thank you. You want a debrief for like two minutes? Uh, yeah, sure.